everyone and welcome to our week two. Our first video here is looking at online learning and its roots in distance education. And this is in the course EDUC 2160, Online Learning Theories and Models. So just to get your pump primed for uh, getting into this content, some of the initial analysis questions that I'd like to consider are the, what is the initial purpose of distance ed? Where did it come from? Why did we need it? How is it traditionally delivered? And what are the components of a distance education system? And so let's take a look at what is distance ed, or bracket DE. I've put up some definitions on this slide and some different terms. Um, terminology or acronym soup is one of the biggest challenges in the field of distance ed, e-learning, online learning, blended learning, hybrid learning. So we'll just start with distance education. And it's characterized by a separation of place and or time between the learner and the structure. Um, so in this case, Moore and Kearsley, 2005, and I've put the, the book this is from at the bottom. This is also a good book for your reference library. Um, they characterize distance ed as uh, distance learning as being used interchangeably with the term distance ed and comment that this is incorrect because distance education includes teaching as well as learning. And so you'll see in bullet point two that they are more apt to frame distance education as teaching and learning, where the learning occurs in a different time and or place from the teaching. Whereas distance learning is generally left as uh, the implied teaching, but not always. So they are being very specific here. And then they talk about distributed education as a term used to reflect three types of distance learning. So if you can think of a bit of a hierarchy, distance education would refer to teaching and learning in a different time and or place. Distance learning is that separation between the learner and instructor and interactions. And then distributed education has all kinds of different delivery methods. And we're going to get into talking about some of those delivery methods in a few, next, uh, few of our next videos. So you have seen this uh, graphic before. We talked about it last week. But just to reinforce, uh, distance education um, initially, and last week I think I mentioned that a lot of people refer to it at the pizza boxes. Um, but as you'll see in this video clip, which I would like to, well, will include here, is it really started with the Postal Service and with getting materials out to people. They weren't always pizza boxes. They were envelopes, usually. Um, and then it grew distance education to include audio and video conferencing. And with the advent of learning management systems, we started to then get into this shift into online learning, e-learning, hybrid learning, blended learning, and then the synchronous tools and the rest of the technology toolkit that you're seeing appear in front of you really started to broaden distance ed into something much bigger than just uh, something you received in the mail. So why would you do distance education? Why was policy created around distance education? Why did governments start to fund and promote distance education? And you'll see on this list some familiar things with respect to online learning. Um, and they have their roots back in distance ed, primarily access. Increasing access to learning for people, increasing the access to content that you could provide. Um, being able to target key groups, so that notion of geographic provisioning, being able to get schools in rural and remote locations content that they would normally not be able to have because they did not have teachers in that content, getting resources um, in the form of course content that would be able to be accessible to that population. The second point, opportunity to update skills. So again, that notion that you don't have to move or relocate. There's a work-family life balance. And you can update your skills in a way that works for you. Um, you're not bound to a structure of an institution. Quality. This is an interesting one. Um, because often, distance education uh, was thought of as sort of the second cousin to uh, more of a face-to-face -face approach to education. Um, but in fact, in many early efforts, the quality and continuing efforts, the quality is one of the key pieces. And the last is cost effectiveness. So there was a notion uh, that it could improve cost effectiveness of, of education and it could increase the educational system. So increase the reach and the impact of the educational system. 
Whether or not it has achieved all of those things is a different question, but those were some of the reasons why uh, distance education was promoted. So what are some of the components in a distance education system? And this is again adapted from Moore and Kearsley. It's just one of many attempts and you'll notice when you do a Google search in, in images, you'll see a variety of different, some very detailed components of a DE system. And you'll see many of them have, you know, moved into that online uh, approach. So you'll see that piece in there. This is trying to keep it nice, clean and clear. So you've got your technology and whether that's a, an envelope and paper and pencil or whether that's your learning management system. And then within there, you have your teaching opportunities, your learning, and your program and course design. All of this is influenced and impacted by your management, which is directed by policy and, uh, and influenced and needs to align with the organization itself. So there's some general components of a DE system. And in the videos and readings for this week, you'll get into a few more details around this. So some of the synthesis questions that I would encourage you to ponder based on watching this video is how does the history of DE influence where we are today with respect to e-learning and online learning? And then would aspects of traditional, sort of that everyone's notion of DE, the paper, pen, paper pencil correspondence, is that useful today? Where is it useful? How? Why is it useful? And then some of the systems components that we've so I've demonstrated or I've shown today, are they still valid? Why and why not? So I would encourage you to ponder those, do the readings, watch the videos, and we'll talk about that in our tutorial this week.